Hello and welcome to Mutiny, or maybe you can think of it as 25 North After Dark. I'm your food guru, Johnny. Sexy. I like. I like the. I like the uh, late night slow jazz radio DJ voice. I'm your GM, Jason. Uh, and I'm here too, Rachel. Not not being late night voice. I don't know. You sound just kind of pretty smooth, uh, sort of generally. Yeah, I, I don't okay. think you have to put on. You don't have to put on late night voice so much <laughs> as you live it. Yeah, sure. It's my life. It is a lifestyle indeed, it is. Uh, Hey, you guys, it has been a long December, and there's reason to believe maybe this year will be better than the last. Uh, So I was thinking maybe we could do just a a little, a little, a little, a little huddle up and discuss how how the show's gone, what we think about how things have gone, and what we foresee in in the ghosts of Christmas future. All right. I I'm gonna actually leave that cough on air because I was inhaling when you made that County Crows reference, and uh, I had got to him. mute myself because I was coughing so much. But these last couple ones got me good. So, got him. bravo, bravo. <laughs> Thank you. I think you know I, I really do think that every year, uh, and and it is very helpful for me to um, uh, every year. You you are. It's, it's very helpful to look back on things and, and to, to try and take another view of things and, and, and get a get a full get the full perspective on it. You know, no, it's and, a uh, it's a it's a very good point, because I think that that's how we grow. That's how we grow. And that's how we better ourselves in the long run is to not. And I, I say this uh, being a totally hypocritical because I do this to myself all the time to not look back and self-criticism. And to look back as learning opportunities. And I don't mean to sound as like, you know, your cliche therapist or meditation instruction or meditation guide. But um, I mean, it it is true. It's like, Mm -hmm. how can we become better and put out a better product if we don't look back and see how the previous year went? Well, you know, Mr. Rogers had it right. And so sometimes when you sound like him, that's okay. Uh, and you know, I, exactly. Let's let's go ahead and let's let's take some stock of uh, of what we thought. So first, let's go chronologically. Let's let's begin mm-hmm. at the very beginning. So uh, we all decided uh, collectively that we were going to expend a, a, a fair bit of effort on an ongoing project uh, where we would all get together and make our schedules. Uh, kind of mesh as best we can, and we would all kind of give up other stuff so that we could fit this into our schedules. We've all we've all given, we've all expended our effort and and done things and sacrificed things uh, for for the purpose of the show. Uh, what was it that we were hoping to get out of it when we first started? We we all said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna go and do all this. We're gonna put all this work into this. What is it that you you guys wanted when you got into this? Do you want to start, Jason? I feel like it was your you know, brainchild. brainchild. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I, I am a, a man of a certain age and uh, I'm 40 years old now, but I remember very vividly back in my mid twenties, right when podcasts were starting to become a thing. I actually did my own podcast for, for about a year and where I will, me and a buddy, we would review movies and that's what we did. We were, we were 20 somethings. We were unattached. We had a lot of free time and a lot of money because the economy was good back then. And we went to go see movies quite a bit. So I did a movie review podcast and it was it went pretty well. We got nowhere the nowhere the amount of listens that this podcast has. But back then, also you got to think that this was right at the birth of podcasting as a whole. So it was something that I've done in the past, and I've always wanted to do again. And being really inspired by some other podcasts that I'm a particular fan of, 
and Johnny, I know you you listen to a couple of the ones that I'm that I'm about to reference here, but uh, Midmaxed are a bunch of Minnesota guys who are doing a run through of Extinction Curse. Uh, Southern Tom Foolery, who have just recently rebranded to Strange Table Fellows, still keeping the acronym STF. They are running through Starfinder, and they actually have a ton of shows. So, um, I, I I like to I like to think of them as Stone Temple Filets. <laughs> I'm sure Adam will appreciate that. I don't know if he's an STP fan. I should ask him. But the last one is uh, Pot Against the Machine. And being listening to these shows and hearing other folks do it, um, and the GMs in particular, have really got my creative juices flowing. And I, having recently been diagnosed with uh, bipolar disorder, needed a creative outlet. Like, that is something that my doctor and my therapist told me is, you need a creative outlet. You need to do something to expend that energy. And what better way to do it than taking my hobby that I love to do and taking these inspirations from these phenomenal GMs and players that I listen to and do my own show. And it wasn't to step on anybody's toes or anything, but I wanted to do my own show and I was trying to rack my brain on what do I want to play? You know, there was a bunch of APs out there. I, well, first off, I knew I wanted to do Pathfinder 2nd Edition because it's my favorite system that I'm playing right now. So I went through and I looked, and there's a, a lot of other shows out there doing this one and doing that one and doing this one and doing that one. And right around the same time that I got inspired to do this, they made the announcement. And by they, I mean Steven Glicker made the announcement that Julian the Gaul Isles is coming out. I was like, oh, that sounds great. What, what's what's this about? Oh, it's island hopping. It's pirates. It's treasure hunting. It's chase scenes. It's rum fueled parties. I mean, this sounded phenomenal. So that was really kind of the genesis. And I was like, okay, I'm going to run this here. Uh, uh, put together a crew. And lo and behold, here we are now. But what did I expect from it? I expected us to have, I think we're right around where, where I was actually expecting us to be. I think we, we, we got, we got, we got off to a really fast start. There was a couple dips in there, here and there. Um, a lot of professional issues came up with some of the cast and with myself. So we had to take, it, it got, it started running a little bit slower, but I think we're right on pace with where I, where I wanted to be. Now, that being said, I think we're, and we'll get into the numbers a little bit later, but we're far exceeding what I expected when it comes to actual statistics and numbers. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I just monologued for a long time. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> it's good to hear. That, that is one of the things that happens on Mutiny, it turns out. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's an interesting one. And um, I'm also, so you've, you've, obviously, you're coming from a place with a, a ton of experience um, with these podcasts, uh, having listened to so many, and um, you've you've had your own ideas and your own vision coming in. Rachel, you've got kind of a different experience. Uh, yeah. It seems like you're kind of a neophyte to this whole thing. Why don't you tell us about uh, about what you were hoping for when you decided, yes, I'm going to sign up for this project. I'm going to do I'm going to do all this all this good stuff. What were you hoping to get out of it? Yeah, I mean, I can remember when Jason first texted me and invited me to the crew, and I have never listen to a real play or any kind of role-playing podcast. I mean, I listen to like, you know, Science Friday podcast, but nothing like this. So I had no idea what this meant. Uh, but, and I, I remember I texted Jason was like, I gotta think about this. Um, but, you know, so I, at the end of the day, I love playing Pathfinder and, you know, like gaming with Jason. And so I said, sure, let's do it. But yeah, I come from a completely different background. Uh, I never listened to these things before. And I actually hate 
uh, public speaking. Uh, like I have literally <laughs> dropped out of college programs because I did not want to do the speech classes. So, you know, it's <laughs> been a been a good learning experience. And you know, in the new year, pushing myself, doing new things. So, uh, it's been fun. It's been good to push myself out of the comfort zone with these ones and the intros and the interviews. So, yeah. But so you were you also were sort of looking at this as a, as a means by which you could satisfy a creative outlet. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I mostly just wanted to play more Pathfinder, uh, you know, but <laughs> it did that also. I mean, as I continued and realized what it entailed, it was like, oh, yeah, I can, you know, write some stories and I can, you know, push myself to get out of my comfort zone. So it's, you know, exceeded expectations in that respect. Interesting. Interesting. Did you have any? Uh, did you have any ideas about uh, about um, the reception to the podcast? Were you expecting um, ticker tape parades, people, uh, <laughs> you know, bringing you up and down the street, no, shouting I mean, out Rachel, Rachel, Rachel? No, I mean that would be my worst nightmare. So no, I did not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I had no expectations. No, you know, again, I had no frame of reference, so I had no idea. But it's been. I mean. You know, I didn't even know we'd have the Discord and everything. So that's been really cool to connect with a community because I've always just gamed with family and friends, uh, not like people I'm meeting just to game. So, yeah. How about you, Johnny? You're, I don't know much about your experience. Yeah. Uh, so I've got a pretty good amount of experience with uh, sort of speech-based media, I guess. I have been live on television somewhere along the order, or I've been live on, been live on air somewhere uh, on the order of a thousand times um, in my life between uh, working at a radio station and working at a television studio. And uh, so I've, I've got a little bit of experience with that stuff, um, but really, um, you know, I, I don't have too much experience with podcasts. I've listened to a couple of podcasts. Uh, I've been a podcast sort of uh, hobbyist or enthusiast for some time. Uh, but I, I only recently, only within the past year and a half, have gotten into Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Um, and uh, only in that time have I started exploring the universe of entertainment related to it. Because when you look at D&D 5th Edition, um, if, you're, if you're a fan of playing 5th Edition or if you're, if you're a fan of tabletop gaming, um, only part of the experience is actually the part at the table. Right. If you're playing, if you're if you're thinking about your D and D character throughout the week, that's going to be like I, I'm I'm going to be I'm I'm not just playing at the table. I'm thinking about my character. I'm thinking about like cool strategies or whatever. Like mm -hmm. I'm I'm thinking about strategies. Other people will think about the fun narrative or or you know fun writing, creative outlet stuff. Um, and so that uh, for fifth edition, which became like super duper popular super quickly. Uh, there became this cottage industry of content around that. And so I, I would get a real kick out of watching uh, people on YouTube discuss the mechanics of the game or the lore uh, mm -hmm. or what, or, you know, um, or indeed, I, I, I found a couple of actual plays that I thought were pretty interesting, like the Adventure Zone uh, was, a, was a pretty key one. And I think that one might be the most popular actual play that has been done. Um, well, critical role. Sure, I don't know. I, I really don't. Um, uh, Critical Role is absolutely huge. Adventure Zone, um, Adventure Zone exists like way outside of tabletop. I, I don't know. I'd be interested in checking out the the actual numbers if they were. Available. Yeah. Because uh, my brother, my brother and me was a massive media empire for a while. Um, but it is true that Critical Role, I think, has introduced a, a ton of people to the game. Anyway, uh, because. Um, there is stuff like the adventure zone and there is stuff like critical role. Um, uh, I, I really got interested in that side of, of D and D that side of the tabletop gaming experience was, was um, enjoying the stuff that I could watch during the week while I was getting my work done or whatever. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, to contribute some stuff like that. And, um, but more importantly than anything else, my expectations were about community. Uh, I had a chance to really meet up with a ton of new people when I got into tabletop role-playing the first time, uh, 
you know, when I was 15, the second time five years ago. And now again, this uh, in the last like year and a half, um, when I've gotten into Pathfinder versus fifth edition, um, I've been able to find um, these incredible communities. And, uh, you know, in fifth edition, it was it was mostly like a bunch of people who were pretty like minded, you know, um, who were largely uh, um, on the same wavelength as I was. But here in Pathfinder land, uh, I find that I have not met a single person I have disliked or even had a, a meaningful, substantive disagreement with. Um, and, you know, that's that's uh, it's a pretty nice one. I feel like I feel like I can just kind of gel with if you are interested in Pathfinder, then you are necessarily interested in X and Y and Z. You are interested in having a creative outlet. You are interested in participating in a community. You're interested in being inclusive about that community because they've got a bunch of their mm-hmm. own standards about inclusion and diversity and so on. Um, and and uh, they have their own de facto ideas about justice. And, and I think those things are all uh, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And so um, for me, my expectation was I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing. I'm going to put in all this effort. And then hopefully what I'm going to get back is I'm going to meet a couple of new people and I'm going to be able to participate in a space that is about this hobby with people who are like-minded. And mm-hmm. uh, as far as that goes, exceeded expectations, double E. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think that was, um, and uh, one of the things I wanted to, have when we started our discord community was exactly that i wanted it to be a space where well our number one rule is we we keep politics at the door you you leave it at the door when you come into our community because uh, it's, it's such a divisive topic and we we didn't want to even even introduce the potential of there being an uproar because I've been part of a number of communities where that's really kind of yeah it, it, it's 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 heated up into some topics but I mean we we have some people on the show who identify as L- LGBTQ and we have individuals in our community as well and we just wanted to be able to enhance and welcome individuals who consider themselves queer or queer adjacent or queer allies. And for myself, I mentioned earlier that I I do suffer from bipolar disorder. So I also wanted to have a big emphasis on mental health because I think that it's important and it should be talked about and it shouldn't be stigmatized and left in even just a doctor's office. We need to normalize mental health and being able to have a space where we can nurture that and help others. And, you know, even just being coming out and saying, Hey, today I'm feeling like shit. I am hitting a depressive low and, you know, I might, I'm, I'm going to disappear for a few hours because I just need to take some time to myself and just normalize that. Um, In addition to what you were saying, Johnny, with there being a creative outlet and there being a community of like-minded individuals who can talk about these nerdy things such as going on and on about the deities that exist in our in this in this world. I mean, that's the stuff we live for, you know. Well, and I mean, you know, you can also uh, in the meeting of these like-minded people, you can also find just your fellow freaks Mm -hmm. uh, because um, everybody, everybody is, uh, everybody is just absolutely bonkers about something. And in my case, I get to assault my community with uh, pictures and recipes and videos of very challenging uh, food items and recipes (laughs) Uh, so, you know, that's been that's been another part of it, too, is just a, a community that I can inflict these things on. Uh, <laughs> and I've really appreciated that uh, a, a very great I, deal. I've tried to carry the torch when you've been absent a couple days. Thank you. Thank you. It's, you know, we got to keep everybody on their toes or whatever body part. I'm not sure. <laughs> and so speaketh our food guru. Yeah. Food guru, indeed. Uh, so... I've got a I've got a question for you guys. Uh, kind of about this past year, um, 
has anything stuck out to you? Have you have you thought have you had like a specific sort of moment uh, uh, during this past year that has really just blown your mind or or something that you know you're going to remember not just from this year, but that you're going to really carry going forward? Yeah, so I'm going to let Rachel handle this one first. In the show, in show memories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I my favorite still is our fight with uh, what was his name, Melar Khan. Did I pronounce that right? I think Mr. so. Mr. Ruffian guy. And the moment where I, I break a little bit, uh, got to bluff him. And continuing on, it was really cool that then, you know, Procta got to break that bluff at just the right moment. And everybody else really tactically fought. But, of course, you know, you remember your own character's moments the most. Or at least I do. Maybe I'm just, you know self-centered but everybody uh, <laughs> does Every, I, you know I, I was about to say i've got one and yeah. guess what it's rodent centric it's rodent. so yeah. ain't no shame in that game go ahead oh okay yeah my favorite part was just that so much i mean i love pathfinder 2e but it is you know rule centric right you know you, there's rules there's a lot of rules and coming from old school game system sometimes i get a little frustrated that you know well that's the rule but i want to do something else so i really liked that in that moment jason said it makes sense that sil can bluff mid combat and melarcon can react to that and you know we're like whether or not that's actually a deception action or whatever it's gonna work and uh so i really appreciate that and then just the teamwork is is a good moment, and I just really picture it too, which is always is, the best moments when you can see it happening. And and it was a moment of real peril because mm-hmm. Roden was down at that point. Like and everybody Rizzard was, was on, almost down. Yeah, yeah, everybody was on their their very last legs, and so um, it was that moment of, of peril. I think that really elevated that. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah, moments of peril are the best. What's your, what's yeah. your Roden moment? Oh, oh, sorry. I mean. Yeah, well, uh, for, as far as the Roden moment goes, um, I am literally, literally never going to forget the the bizarre run-up that we had about uh, whether we should inflict lethal or non-lethal mm. damage. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, that, we, we had, uh, we had a, a solid four play sessions where we were like, oh man, should we be killing these sentient beings? And, you know, when are we going to inflict lethal damage and when are we going to go non-lethal? Mm-hmm. And uh, then at one point, we're fighting a sentient deck of cards. It's a powerful treasure, that certainly that Syl um, has expressed interest in, mm-hmm. uh, because we already knew that Syl wanted to go down this gambit path that Syl has gone down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, uh, in my infinite wisdom, elected to do non-lethal damage to that pack of playing cards. Uh, after, of course, I had managed to roll double nat 20s on my flurry of blows, and produce a staggering 46 points of bludgeoning damage at level one. Would have been enough to just end the combat, and then, you know, truly it would have been a a 52-card pickup, but uh, alas, (laughs) um, uh, it was not meant to be because it was completely immune to that damage. Going from 46 to zero is um, not only what happened right there, it is also what happens in car crashes. (laughs) It was uh, it was it was brilliant because it was completely unplanned. Mm-hmm. The the fact that you know, like you said, everything leading up to it, even because Rachel and Syl just kind of kicked it off. It's like, really, do we want to be killing these folks? Right. And Corey and Rizark are like, well, we kill everything. Just kill everything. It's a pirate town. It's not like they've never had de- drunken brawls that ended in death before. I mean, why not? And it was just like the whole group was just having this moral dilemma and to have it, they say the dice tell the best stories. And in this instance, the dice really told the best story. Double nat 20s on your flurry of blows, elected to do non-lethal damage. You combine those for the purposes of resistances and immunities and weaknesses. And lo and behold, it's immune to non-lethal. It was it's hilarious. Chef's kiss. <laughs> Absolutely remarkable. What, it, so you, you, if you start just with the dice rolls, that is a one in 400 chance 
uh, which is to say you're, you're, you're only going to see that like maybe, maybe, maybe once every couple of years in your life. When you, when you combine that once in a 400 chance with fucking it up so spectacularly, it is truly a remarkable thing. Yeah. But uh, I, I think, uh, Jason, that you have got a couple of moments uh, um, of yourself uh, that you yeah. want to reflect on. So let's think about those. So I think for me, some of the some of my favorite moments have really come down to um, the role playing moments. I think what sticks out to me. I mean, obviously, the horny comedy is always going to be there because that's kind of become our de facto default mm-hmm. when <laughs> for our shows is it's like this teen it's like an American pie teen raunchy sex comedy that mm-hmm. we've we have going for us and there, it's, yeah it's it, well there's horniness there's horniness but there's a classiness to it like yeah. there's yeah there's, Sarah pulls it, there's it never off the in actual, a way. Yeah. Exactly. Like there's never anything that's just like flat out dirty. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is very, right. very, very lewd. Yeah. I, so, I mean, that's, that stuff kind of like, it sticks out to me and, um, and I love it. I love it. But I think the, there's a couple moments there that have really kind of turned it up a, a notch when it comes to role playing dramatics I think there was an interaction between Procta and Rizark at the at the Waystone that is just where you know they 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 open themselves up a little bit and you know we start talking about you know what does this mean that we are actually dealing and collecting this power and collecting this magical energy that has been dormant for centuries. And, like, what are we actually going to end up doing with it? And Rizrik's like, well, you know, might as well embrace that power. And you can see there where Cynthia's like, well, we need it because we need to get into the mountain. We need to get into her training grounds, Poppy's training grounds. But even, like, Cynthia and Proctor is like, well, you know, do we really deserve this? And it's... She didn't say as much as at least that's how it came off to me, that conversation, which I thought was brilliant. And then just a little for me to as a GM, and this is very GM centric. Again, we're going to be self congratulatory or (laughs) self reflective. Everybody, nobody can help it. Uh, None of us are selfish. Everybody does it. But for me, I think as a GM, what some of my absolute favorite things that have happened in our show is the fact that none of you have seen these monsters before. These are the first time you've ever faced any monsters like this. Like they 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 come they're either coming from the RPG Superstar uh, contest and so community generated monsters or they were de- designed and developed specifically for this module for this AP. And seeing you all work out how to deal with these monsters is brilliant. I, I, I think of the very last combat we had against the Iron Fern. Like, that's something that you've never encountered before. And it got dicey. It got real dicey. And I, But you've, you've been able to overcome them and just really shining the mechanics or shining the spotlight on the mechanics of how infinitely important recall knowledge is and how we can exploit those vulnerabilities and those weaknesses is um, that's some of my favorite parts. Some of my favorite moments is you all trying to figure out how to deal with it and the light bulb. Aha. Now we figured it out. It's been, it's been a puzzle. It's been a chess game up to this point, but now I can see the route to chess mate checkmate. And that ties in uh, very directly into the point um, that uh, Rachel made earlier about peril and about how the peril is a necessary ingredient um, because because there is so much peril, right? There, the peril is a necessary ingredient to create something memorable, to in, or, in order to have high enough stakes uh, narratively to create something memorable, um, you have to have that. But in addition to that, the peril necessitates good tactics. The game is difficult enough that if you go in there swinging three times every time and you don't bother flanking, 
you're you're not going to be able to win flat out. Your your favorite cool character that you've spent all this time in between sessions thinking about is going to get rocked, and then you're going to have to spend uh, a couple more weeks thinking about a new character. <laughs> if you um, pizza so, when you should have French fried, you're going to have a bad time. Bingo! Exactly the case. And so the thing is that the the because there is so much peril baked into the difficulty curve of this game, it requires you to learn and it requires you to do a good job or else your favorite character's dead and like, oops, uh, that's the end of that story. And it's, it's not the ending maybe you would have written for yourself. Um, and so because there is this high difficulty, uh, it, it, I don't know, I've, I've, I find the challenge to be liberating for me because it means I can take the kid gloves off um, when it comes to trying to power game or whatever. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, it allows me to play as hard as I, as, as well as I can. Uh, and I find that to be just a really, it's, it's an interesting ingredient, both to the narrative side, as well mm-hmm. as to the mechanical side and the tactical and the tactics that are necessitated too. I think it's, you, you hit the nail spot on, or the nail, you hit the nail right on the head that, um, narratively you all have, all have been able to actually achieve that as well where you're really reliant on Procta who Cynthia herself has said that you know Carl Sagan is her inspiration if you take Carl Sagan and put him in the HP Lovecraft mythos you have Procta that is like that's Procta right there she's always taking notes and jotting things down on her book so narratively it makes a whole lot of sense for her character to be the one who's like, well, okay, we're dealing with a monster that can do X. We should probably try to exploit Y. Totally. It. I mean, the, I, every time we talk, I end up waxing about how great the, the design of this game is. Um, and certainly the combat puzzle idea, um, it, it really, like, it, it opens up um it opens up the opportunity for different teammates to contribute in all their different ways. Like it, it really makes it so that everybody has got their own special thing. And it, it's just such a great like team based game where um, recalling knowledge really is just as important as being the person who uh, does the damage. It really is just as important as being the person who steals the enemy actions or does the debuffs or whatever. All these different roles are mm. uh, are necessary a- as well as being super duper strong. Um, so it's, I don't know, every, every time I talk about this game, I'm just like, yes, this game rules. <laughs> Let me... Um... Let me quick highlight some of the some of the listeners. I, I crowdsourced uh, this exact question for this exact show, so I have a few moments uh, jotted down here, and I want to bring them up. And I'm just going to throw these out there, and you all feel free to comment if you so choose mm-hmm. on them. So, Eek, uh, aka Tyler, aka the voice of Davy Jones. Mm-hmm. He submitted a few here. He says, in general, Wanjik. The cold open with him seeing how people interact with each other was eye, was eye opening. That's that was the one where Wanjik is having a conversation with the bartender, mm-hmm. and the bartender's like, "Well, no, you have a pretty face. You're good looking." Mm-hmm. And he's like, "What does it mean to be good looking?" What do you all think one. of that one? Oh man, like the the entire sort of um, uh, I don't know B plot that uh, that Wanjik has is so intriguing to me. Like the, I I I really want to piece together this backstory so bad, um, and that mystery just kind of dangling juicily in front of me is uh, it's incredible. I'm I'm a huge huge fan of that. Yeah, well, and the fact I mean Sarah, like we said earlier, has always been able to somehow make Wan endearing rather than creepy jerk which is Mm -hmm. amazing considering the one-liners we get um (laughs) but i I think that cold open really helped too it kind of gave that insight into why wanjik is endearing and intriguing rather than just you know the creep we are putting up with so right very cool yeah speaking of cold opens uh tyler's bringing up another one here 
the cold open were pro uh, with Procta, where we got a bit more reveal on where her powers come from. Now, yeah. Cynthia has been knocked it out of the park with both of her cold opens, so. Yeah, yeah. She really, um, she invokes, uh, like, the real, like, the, she invokes that H.P. Lovecraft so seriously. Like, she's got such an, such a, uh, she's got such an eye for um, dialogue. Uh, she's got such an eye for um, descriptors uh, in her writing. Um, it, it specifically the one where she kind of met little Clulu, or, or, or um, the one where mm -hmm. little Clulu became part of her. Uh, the it, it was it was just kind of like a, a it was lovely, and then at the very end, like my freaking blood ran cold. Like she has she has this eye for um, uh, construction of plot in these that I think is just remarkable. Well, and even outside her cold opens, I remember after only a couple sessions with her playing, playing Procta and describing the spells, I literally went downstairs and told whoever was around, my dad or my husband, like, I, I can never play a spellcrafter now because that is so amazing how she describes her spells, like what's happening. It's just like, and it carries over to her cold opens and her dialogue. It's really awesome to hear. I think that's one of the things I really love about this as a hobby is that um, uh, the and I've talked to about about this before, where the 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 uh, barrier to entry of your creative out, output is nil. Like she she literally is just freestyling a single verse about a spell every time she casts one. She just writes a single sentence about it, and it is a good sentence and it's beautiful and she narrates it and it's lovely. Um, but it's only one sentence. It's not hard to get a little bit of creativity out of yourself. If it's just one sentence on your turn in combat, you can still produce these incredibly flavorful things that push the narrative forward, um, in addition to, to providing so much more characterization for your character. And I love the way that even though she has this remarkably evocative style, um, it's not like we just stop and like now it's the practice show for like 10 minutes or whatever. <laughs> it's just like, here's this, here's this like kind of um, uh, meaningfully spooky, you know, little, little uh, bit of verse for yeah, you. Yeah, it flows in very naturally for sure. Yeah, it, it goes back to the, the, I, I talk about light bulb moments and I mentioned the light bulb moment when the party figures out the path to checkmate when in this combat. I had a light bulb moment way back in the day. And this was before college. This was in high school where I had a GM ask one of my party members. Like he, the party member says, I'm casting magic missile. He's like, awesome. What does your magic missile look like? Hmm. Mm -hmm. That one question was like, blew my mind open. I was like, well, holy shit. Yeah. Your magic missile can look like anything you want it to look like. Whether they're these tiny little skulls that fly out, or they're the like the standard piercing mm -hmm. bolts of force, or my wife, when she played a spellcaster, she, her magic missiles were little kittens that <laughs> leapt. They of pounced course. out of her hand. Of course. <laughs> yeah, they're little kittens that pounced out of their, her hand. That was her magic missile. I was like, oh, like that, that was really kind of eye opening and to exactly to the point you were saying, Johnny, where string together five words. That's all you need. Just five words on what does your magic missile look like? And, and the, the benefit of having even that tiny bit of creative outlet um, on your mental health uh, is remarkable. I, I find it shocking, really, um, how many people go through their entire lives, uh, it seems, just working and then consuming. And that's the whole, that's it. Like, there's no creating anywhere. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I, I do my thing and then I watch people, um, you know, play sports or I watch actors act and that's all I do. And, um, you know, by all means, consumption, everybody please enjoy the things that you enjoy i'm not i'm not trying to knock anybody's uh, i'm not trying to yuck anybody's yum or, or knock anybody but i find the act of creation to be so fundamentally different uh from the rest of of the modes of my life 
Um, and, and I find the fact that we can just kind of, you know, I can just say something that sounds a little yeehaw and that's fun. And it is, it is this, it is this almost rebellious <laughs> act for me. Speaking of, of character, character moments, Tyler brings up his, his next one is exactly that is he says he enjoys Rizerk digging through his bits and bobbles for random items that to me was a little tiny bit of brilliance by Corey having Rizzerk play a toadstool dragon who collects knickknacks and bobbles and just like reaches into his in, into his coat into his vest to pull them out at random times is this little tiny bits of character flavor that just adds so many layers to that character I think of, I think of Brad Pitt's character in Ocean's Eleven. When you go back and watch Ocean's, Ocean's Eleven, he's never not eating. He's always has food in his hand. He's always snacking on something, and it's never mentioned. It's never talked about. It is just that is a tiny little moment of character that stuck out to me as as a movie nerd, as a movie aficionado. And I feel the very same way with Rizzerk, where he has like broken compasses and telescope uh, telescope lenses, or or not a telescope. Bits what of is, string. I remember yeah. the bits yeah. of frayed string, and uh, I I actually wondered, kind of at the time, if he had pre-written a list of detritus or detritus. I'm sorry, a list of I, detritus. He did, didn't he? And I, I don't know I if he, I don't surprised. know if he did or if he freestyled it. I could not tell you which. I thought he said at one time that like that was my last something something or something along those lines that made me suddenly realize. I, I think he wrote it ahead of time, which I I would not be surprised if Corey had a is keeping an inventory mm-hmm. of all the random knickknacks and baubles that Rizzerk has in his and he we added that masterwork fishing kit for mm-hmm. him too. So he not he now has fishing hooks and tackle and bait and <laughs> well see while it would not surprise you guys for him to have pre written it I it would not surprise me if he said oh that's the last you know broken compass I forget what it was that's the last broken compass maybe he said that as a bit of really excellent believable improvisation good call potentially so, could be either know, way with him and either yeah. either one either one either of those uh, is is a path to creative. Mm-hmm. Brilliance and mm-hmm. creative expression, and that you know, if you're if you're if you're going to talk about what we got done this year, I really expressed myself a lot, and it was pretty nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This this next one is this one specifically targeted right at Rachel. Eh. The Uh-oh. underwater combat where a certain character discovers a special ability ah. was quite excellent. Yay. I was really happy with that moment. Uh, I intentionally, as we were entering the water, decided to randomly make Syl afraid of water and climb on Rodin's back, just in the hopes that, you know, when it came out, because I, of course, knew they could breathe. They didn't know they could breathe underwater, um, that that would be even more fun. Um, so, I yeah, that was a great combat. I, not just from Syl's perspective, the fact that we had to do that teamwork moment where we all pushed Procta back. Was, and again, the peril of almost dying. So, I, I I honestly would have felt really, really bad if I killed Cynthia's character. Oh my gosh. And maybe, in how many combats was that? That was like seven was episodes? Like, yeah, our second serious combat. Yeah. I know we had others, but... It was the second time it actually felt dangerous. I think. Oh. That was a ball. Well, what was uh, what was your reaction, Johnny, when you found out that uh, Syl was amphibious? Well, I I actually was um, really appreciating the fact that Rachel had planted the seed of Syl being afraid of or discomfited by water. Um, I, I love, I love, love, love when uh, when you can do foreshadowing or seed planting like that. And um, I was, I was giddy. I was like, oh yeah, like hell yeah. Um, of course she can naturally. Uh, and then um, I really did have a lot of fun uh, later on. Um, I believe I characterized you as um, uh, playing with the dolphins while the rest of us were getting slaughtered. That's right. Um, <laughs> yes. So. 
So picking at you for for the way for that excellent reveal was also just a very fun outcome of that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Between character picking on banter is my favorite. Absolutely. Love teasing people. We just have a couple more here. Uh, this one comes from Mike, who does the voice of Lupus Gallo, the Chellish Captain. He he says less of a less of a moment and more of a behind the scenes peek. Do the players listen to the pre show scenes, and if so, what were your what were your thoughts on some of them? I think we've we've alluded to a couple, but. Yeah, we, we definitely, uh, I mean, I definitely do listen to them. Um, I, I do wonder sometimes, like, if, like, it's obvious that Roden shouldn't know about them. Uh, I wonder sometimes if that will, if, if my sort of meta knowledge will bleed in. Um, but I try to keep it from doing that. And uh, hopefully I've succeeded thus far. Dear listeners, let me know if I failed. Um, but yeah, I do listen. And I think that. Um, what's really interesting about those is that those little three minute vignettes, because they are pre-written, um, you can pack a lot more characterization into those. You can pack a lot more action into those than you can about uh, in, in a cooperative scene uh, of improvisation. And so um, when you're when you're talking about like the narrative payoff, those little two, three minute vignettes, um, that's some of the most action packed stuff in the entire you know hour of listening. So yeah, I love that stuff. And I, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that. And uh, uh, I think that there is, I, I wish that um, there was more of a, of a way of incorporating that at the table in a non show way. Uh, I would like to be able to do vid, like solo vignettes or flashbacks with my buddies. Uh, just at the table in, as a way of um, characterizing my, my character a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm I'm gonna to pitch that to my table. Just like, hey guys, I don't know if you guys want to, but um, we could just do like this little one minute pre-written thing in addition to, you know, the session recap that we do. Mm-hmm. And then that way we can all get to know each other's characters a little bit better. Yeah. I also listen to the cold opens. Um, I really appreciate the fact in addition to everything Johnny said, that it adds intrigue to us, not just from what the other characters are doing, but from the story that Jason's building that's happening around our little campaign that clearly at some point we're going to collide with, um, such as the lupus moment where I suddenly realized someone's out hunting for my character and had no idea beforehand and... You know, the Hurricane Queen's out there doing stuff that's going to impact us at some point and trying to piece together all that intrigue is really fun. Keeps us on our toes. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. And the last one we have is from uh, Sir Newt, who says, One of my favorite moments from early on is Procta dragging Wanjik away from the bar. And Wanjik screaming, no, she was eating out of the palm of my hand. <laughs> oh my God. That would like, uh, Sarah is so good at that character. Um, and I think that that was probably the single high water mark of that character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dealing with that, with the fortune teller. I was yeah. going to say, was that with the fortune teller? Okay. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So thank you listeners for contributing and giving us some of your favorite moments. Um, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. And yeah, some excellent highlights there. Just awesome. So uh, I think also, Jason, that you've got prepared for us a couple of statistics about this yes. past year. Yes, 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 gotcha. yes. Hey, HMU with the numbers. Give me, give me, uh, give me a twenty-five north wrapped. So we started the the year off on May third. That was the the release of our very first episode not not proper episode but it was it was our very first release and that was meet cynthia and to this to this day that one is let me look it up here is our second our third most downloaded episode the the most downloaded episode is episode one and we've hit 427 episodes of that downloaded episode two was is our second with 289 and Meet Cynthia is our third with 277. So many people have met nice. Cynthia. 
(laughs) (laughs) So we first released our episode on May 3rd. Since then, just as of an hour ago, we are at 6,031 downloads total. My God. My God. Our community has grown. We have 72 Discord members, not including bots. There's a handful of bots in there, too. But 72 Discord members. We've released 27 episodes proper and nine bonus episodes. That's the meet the or meet uh, the the meet the five meat episodes or six meat episodes, the two goblin episodes, and the one mutiny episode that you, that we released this year. And those are our numbers. We are growing. I like I like I've I've made. I try to release or write up a kind of um, a from the desk of the GM about every Monday or so, sometimes Tuesdays, in the Captain's Quarter channel. And I mentioned in there that I had I had no expectations that we would even get to six thousand downloads. You know, I, I talked early on. Um, I, I have regular conversations in, in uh, DMs with Stephen Glicker. And he had mentioned that, you know, his show, Roll for Combat, um, they get millions of downloads. Just absolute millions of downloads. They're probably the biggest Pathfinder uh, podcast out there. I don't know. Maybe. Or GCP. Maybe Glass. I was about to say, maybe Glass Cannon. But um, I have no idea. It's either, it's either Roll for Combat or Glass Cannon. Those are the top two. And awesome. I was just like, I. Millions of episode downloads. I'm that's no, but one day, uh, one 6,000 in less than a year. It, it blows my mind, man. It blows my mind. 6,000 in, in basically s- six months because the first month there was just the meet the episodes. That is just crazy. Well, you know, um, if you take the difference between one million, you take a million and you, you subtract. 6,000, mm-hmm. right? So that's that's the difference between where we are and the millions. And you take that difference and you round it down, zero. We're basically there. <laughs> Absolutely. Like your math. So Absolutely. We're, we're well on the way, I would say. 6,000, so, you know, it's uh, um, uh, people, people often say, uh, what's the difference between uh, a billion and a million? About a billion. And that this is this is that I think I think we're basically on the way to millions of downloads. This is how you get started. And uh, every every journey of a million downloads starts with 6000 steps. Absolutely. Absolutely. I am flabbergasted that we we have as many and I'm infinitely humbled and grateful to our community for continuously uh, spreading the word and shouting us out. Um, I, I, I regularly check the the Reddit the, the Pathfinder 2E subreddit, and it feels like once every month or so, somebody's asking for recommendations on podcasts or live streams, and um, the, we have a few listeners in there who are who constantly uh, shout us out, and, and eternally grateful for that. Yeah, it, it, I feel like it means so much more than "Hey, I have a show, check mm-hmm. me out." To have a, to have listeners be like, "Yo." I listen to these this crew. They're awesome because that for whatever reason they want, and um, that 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 goes way further. I totally do have to agree. Um, it is awesome to have these listeners who care enough to plug us, uh, and it's it's just awesome to be able to to share um, this this neat new adventure. Like we're, we're able to share so many interesting things with you guys. Like, okay, we've got uh, we're giving you guys a preview of this AP. Uh, we're letting you guys know about um, this cool art and the cool beasts. Um, you know, some some people are still kind of new to Pathfinder Second Edition, and so they're learning how to how to play the game with us. Um, there are so many angles mm-hmm. that people come to these actual play podcasts from, and it's just a, a pleasure to share with people on whatever level they're coming from. Absolutely, and not only that. We are literally one of a kind. So far, um, 
in their last live stream of the year, Stephen and Mark alluded to that this might be their one and only adventure that they write. Just because it is such an insane amount of work and stress to put these to put adventures together like this. And the the Steven poured his heart and soul into it. I was having a conversation in one of the discords uh, last week about how how much content is packed into just book one alone. Mm-hmm. And it is essentially double the size of a normal Paizo adventure book. So th- like our our three books is about six like an entire six book AP's worth of content. That's mm-hmm. so much work and so much blood, sweat and tears and dedication and heart and commitment went into this adventure that it's Steven said that this, he's never going to say never. But <laughs> where he sits right now very likely the the one and only adventure he'll write or he'll he'll direct or he'll develop. Sure. Well, it shows. I mean, it's been an amazing AP to play so far. Every encounter is so well thought out and all the plot and everything. It's really and awesome. The, the characters, too. Mm-hmm. The NPCs, the The maps art. and the NPCs. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, that's that's another thing that I... That continues to impress me as I'm as a as I'm checking out the Paizo verse uh, coming from the wizard verse you know uh, basically if it's not from Wizards of the Coast if it's from Wizards of the Coast it's not going to be as good as the stuff that comes from Paizo and if it's not Wizards of the Coast it's going to be homebrew from some somebody who doesn't know what they're doing whereas here like the stuff from Paizo is absolutely top-notch and if you hear about a third per- a third party product, for Pathfinder Second Edition, if you've heard of it, it I'm willing to vouch for it. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to say, you know, if if Jason Bowman puts anything out, I'm going to say it's good. If Mark Seifter puts anything out, yep, it's going to be good. Uh, you know, and and so um, that's another one of the things that's excellent about Paizo is um, they let their employees kind of rock. You know, uh, they don't they don't do any of the any any weirdness. Um, uh, blocking people or any non-compete kind of stuff. Just everybody's allowed to do their own thing. And, and cottage industries are allowed to form around the product. And, yeah. You know, with the o- that nice OGL, yeah. Luis Loza has a couple of ancestries up on his Patreon. Like, you can just go in and I think he has, like, an opossum-based one, a, a, a no. The panole, the panole. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, I'm I'm a sucker for the panole. That that <laughs> one, that's an excellent one. And then I think he has a rabbit folk one as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shout shouting out more three PP stuff, and we have a, a few three PP developers in our who've joined our community too. So shout out to Sean from Elder Osiris putting oh, yeah, out yeah, yeah. phenomenal stuff. Absolutely. And that's that's the thing is like I still haven't run across anything that's you know, um, that is poorly made. I haven't run across anything where I'm just like, oh yeah, you, you didn't even think this through, you know, um, in the same way that uh, that you would run into the, the homebrew stuff uh, in D&D where it would just be somebody uh, creating, you know, whatever. Um, everything feels more thoughtful. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, uh, so we are um, about to wrap up but I think before we go, um, we've had a chance to look back at 2022, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and give it a Viking funeral. I'm going to I'm going to shove it off into the sea and shoot a flaming arrow at it, uh, and then roll your rage uh, attack. Oh, oh boy! Oh is it boy! Be, is it beyond? Your- uh oh! <laughs> yeah, that, that's outside of my increment uh, for sure. Um, but I think that uh, now, that, now that we're going to put this 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 accursed year to bed, uh, let's look forward to a brighter a brighter tomorrow, uh, and let's let's see what we want to think about. What are you guys looking forward to in twenty twenty three? I'll go ahead. And get, yeah, go yeah, ahead. I'll go ahead and get started. There's a couple things that I'm really looking forward to. Um, first and foremost, I would say I should say first. Not foremost. This is in no particular order, but uh, there is a new AP coming out f- from Paizo 
called The Sky King's Tomb. And I've kind of called dibs on that one in some of the other um, Pathfinder podcast communities that I that I participated in. And everybody's kind of like, yeah, sure, go for it. <laughs> so, again, this the fact that we have so much content to go through, we're not probably not going to get to it in 2023. Maybe not even in 2024. But One day. I am very much looking forward to reading a dwarven themed campaign mm-hmm. because as Johnny has so lovingly called me the resident dwarf enthusiast, uh, it's been something I've been clamoring for for a long time. So that's 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 on the list. But I think the thing that I'm most looking forward to is building up and starting to more thoroughly weave in the uh, the meta plots that I've been starting and kicking off and writing. And I have a, a, a planning board, like the, like, you know, the true oh, crime. The red pod- twine? Yeah. No, no red twine, but I have a bunch of post-it notes up there. Uh, okay. You should uh, probably I thought, I thought angle were... your camera over there so we can prove it <laughs> to us. There's a reason. Yeah, you should show <laughs> that to us for sure. So that we can see your beautiful mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm look. I'm really looking forward to starting to bleed in some of these, some of these plot threads that I've started weaving, and I know exactly how that's going to happen in the next few chapters, particularly in book two, because I've, I've started weaving that in. So we're going to see a lot more of the Chelish Navy and the Free Captains, and maybe even some of the outcome of. Davy Jones attack and as as a herald of Besmaro who is who has her own machinations. Amazing. So oh my god. I'm my really god. excited for that too. Uh, Mainly because I don't know my character's past, uh, and I'm excited to find out when those stories hit what happened with Syl in the past, it, who they were. The, uh, and for the listeners, the, there this isn't Rachel being lazy. This is no, no. This is a a a, a choice was made. Yes, I have mm. wanted to play amnesic background for a long time, and I knew that Jason, as a GM, would be willing to do that. So, uh, and create that. So, I'm very excited. I got a couple bullet points, you know, that you've heard in cold opens, but I don't know. I don't really know who they were, and I'm excited to find that out. I'm really most days I think at least for a while about how Syl is going to behave with new memories and personality coming back so yeah character development always excited for character development wow wow (laughs) Uh, I'm also super excited um, to sort of resolve some of the mystery around these characters Um, I'm not a big fan of serialized media I don't like to watch TV as it's being released. I don't like, you know, I will I will read a trade paperback after a storyline has been resolved in a comic book, but I don't like um, seeing it unfold. Mm-hmm. Tabletop is the one time that I actually, that, that it works that way. Because otherwise, you know, I would just have to play one game for 24 hours and that would be terrible. <laughs> um, so this is one of the few uh, the few areas in my life where I where I do I do get to have just that terrible suspense. I hope it lasts of of trying to of wondering what it is that's going to come up next. And so uh, certainly I think understanding more about um, Wan Jik's nature. I think understanding about Sil's past. Um, I'm super duper excited to see uh, what comes uh, from from your your work uh, uh, with these meta plots with these A and B plots and and kind of putting these together, Jason. I think that's going to be remarkable. Um, the main thing I look forward to this year is just continuing to to share some experiences and uh, and and just some fun times um, and and some jokes with uh, listeners, with my friends, um, with with you guys. Uh, it is it is just such a pleasure all the time. And it's so nice to just kind of have people that I can uh, say, look at this egg mess. Look at this terrible egg mess. And everybody will say, yes, Johnny, we love it. Thank you. Not enough uh, mayo. Exactly. Yes. 
and that, and that warms that warms my my dead tiny black heart. Uh, and and so I you know I look forward to that for sure. Um, and finally, I guess um, in terms of just the game, uh, I am very much looking forward to um, uh, the Treasure Vault, uh, which is going to be an upcoming book uh, this this year. Oh yeah, um, I that one's going to be coming out pretty soon. I think. Oh God. Um, but that's going to be awesome because that's going to help uh, them overhaul alchemists a little bit, I think. Uh, and, and alchemists have needed a bump for a little while. Yeah. So um, mechanically, adding, that one's going to open up a ton of options. And you know how much I love mechanics. And adding a bunch of new magical tattoos, too. Oh, Sweet. finally. Yeah. All right. We only have a handful of them. But no low-level feat- ones. Yeah. Yeah, there's a yeah. feat there. And yeah, they're all pretty high level. So mm-hmm. more magical tattoos will be awesome. Yeah, they, oh, they did oh. such a great job with Secrets of Magic of releasing like all of these things that could be extended upon, like the spell hearts. There was one page of spell hearts, but spell hearts as an item group are fucking godly. Like that's the best item group. Uh, so I'm I'm excited. I, 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 I want to see that stuff filled yeah. out because if you only have like five of these Fulus or five magical tattoos or five, then the category doesn't really matter but once you have like a ton of things in the category it it becomes important so i'm I'm excited for that mechanical stuff for sure and then uh certainly um uh i'm excited to to see my dwarf king jason reading about the dwarf (laughs) king and uh also we were just a couple weeks away from the slime ancestry being released. Oh, yeah. that's a big one. Oh man, I have been year of monsters, Ooh. ladies and gentlemen. Ooh. <laughs> oh, I've been looking forward to the slime ancestry for a long time. My 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 ongoing joke has been, uh, I can't wait to be slimy and also in the game. <laughs> we uh, it was myself and I think Indy and Eek and you. We were trying to build Slimer from Ghostbusters. Yeah. I think oh. we decided on what a fighter sorcerer with glutton jaw. Uh, that is right. Fighter, fighter sorcerer with glutton's jaw and uh, the ghost archetype. So it, it would be, um, I guess two, four, six sorcerer. And then from, and, and then from, from there on ghost, uh, mm-hmm. but it would be Slimer would be an incredible tank, uh, because the glutton's jaw gets you temporary HP on every hit. Uh, and then as a ghost, you get tons of resistances to damage. So mm-hmm. it is just uh, Slimer is unkillable, which is thematically appropriate. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Nice. Cannot wait to do that stuff. Uh, and in fact, um, I cannot wait to, to, to get to 2023 so much that I'm going to say, let's get the fuck out of here. May <laughs> your party never end, everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed mutiny. Hey. Cheers. Cheers.